tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 12, Episode 6. It's the first episode of 2023, and a Happy New Year to you. I'm your host, Otis Jerry, and in this episode I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Dale Thompson. Tonight you'll hear tales of repossessed rocks, devilish deals, phantasm fakery, and insolent insomnia. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the dare, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail, so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> A bet. A simple thing, easy to understand, especially when it's a game between children. Unfortunately for little Ray, things may be going just a little too far this time. You see, there are some things best left alone, even if done in the utmost innocent fashion. And there are things that one just can't unsee. Without further ado, I present to you Live and Learn. The unknown is viewed as a dark place. The absence of light can mean ignorance. Ignorance relates to mentality, but not in the academic arena. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'd admit there's nothing in the dark that is not in the light. The idea of such is chaotic, and chaos breeds panic, and panic becomes tunnel vision. Hyperopia is focus, yet focus has no peripheral vision, and thus it loses the broader picture. It crushes visional truth into something that can be easier explained by funneling it and suffocating it at the bottom. A person can be successful and remain in darkness. You can know the mysteries of the universe and never know yourself. It's about the lies we allow ourselves to believe. Some are gullible for gain, others are unknowingly fleeced and are left with nothing. Some learn from mistakes, others repeat mistakes. Some never learn. Many will only ever know pain. The idea that some enjoy pain, as sadistic as it sounds, is an illness and not pleasure at all. Their pain is welcome to mask much deeper hurt and scars. There's desertion and abandonment, and there's no one to come sweep up the broken pieces. The person lies, fractured, smashed with words, 
and destroyed in the humiliation. They stand alone if they can even stand at all. As transgressors, doomed for all eternity, it should come as no surprise that lists of transgressions do mount and they become too burdensome to bear. What destroys a man is his own undoing. He can see himself unraveling, yet it is so mesmerizing, so intoxicatingly hypnotic, in a moment of staggered inebriation, his vulnerabilities are revealed to the entire world. There's a sense of urgency, like a watchman on the wall. The alarm has sounded, but no one knows why. The truth is this. The ringing in the ears, which everyone believed was nerve endings dying, was in fact the last of unheeded church bells fading for the last call to worship in his lifetime. Our thinkers have lost their concentration. Virgin wisdom has been spoiled. Genie doesn't fit back in the bottle once uncorked. Prudence has been stripped naked in the square and in the shame exposed to every peering eye, no one comes with a garment to cover it. We're to believe the unbelievable and disbelieve the truth. Truth is now subjective and undefined. This is our world where nothing ever changes. Everything remains the same, and as we get older, we repeat it all again. This certainly isn't the first time a story was penned concerning the nightmare in which we coexist. I would pray that it would be the last one, yet we failed to bow to God. He's been erased. We, the people, are our own worst enemies. Every single one of us seems to have a self-destruct gene. Sometime in our lives, without us knowing, this gene is activated, and when it's turned on, we drink too much, eat too much. We become all-consuming, like a fire in a forest. Enough is never enough. We become fat when we want to be skinny. We're skinny, but we're not skinny enough. Everything God's given us, we try to change. When we work against the laws of nature, in the end, nature dies by our murderous hand. We take a step back and see what we've done and expect someone else to rescue what remains. But those who sleep, sleep. It's sacrilege to disturb the dead. Walk quietly upon their graves so they know not that you're there. Place your flowers upon the gravestones. For one day, you too will be there. Allow not their memories to fade away. Say your peace and walk away. Reverently honor them and forget them not. Never wake the dead. Keep your youth as long as you can, for it's much more resilient than what you'll eventually become. When you make a mistake, there's no sin that cannot be fixed. Make it right as quickly as you can, or something will grow from the indiscretion and devour all you know. There's time, but don't delay. On a cold autumn afternoon, most every tree is naked and bare. They've rained down the leaves, floating and spinning, bedding the earth with red, yellow, brown, and green colors. Of shaded death they lay. The days when the leaves rustled in the wind before detaching were over. The last beautiful display of the season, before the bitter cold in the hibernated solemnity is welcome in, and fills the skies with white flurries, laying sheets of ice and snow to pack the land. A single leaf, stubbornness goes, hangs alone, refusing to let go. It's slapped about by every chilling wind, but defies the change and refuses to fall. Jack suggests a bed. I say that leaf will cling to that branch all winter. Jack was 13, going on 21. He was smart as a whip. He had good math skills and prided himself as a bit of a daredevil. However, his days of risk-taking were over, at least until he repaired his dirt bike, which had taken a damaging spill the previous week. Jack was hardly injured except for banging up his elbow, but no bones were broken. I'll take the bet, Keenan, his best friend, spoke up. He was also 13. They'd always known one another. 
Keenan was no daredevil. He was more the sort who would double dare, but not double down. Stay, he was feeling lucky. I predict two days, and it'll drop just like the others. Two days? Look at it up there. Ray pointed as a gentle breeze rocked the leaf around in a flapping motion. Ray had just turned 14. Although he was older than Jack and Keenan, he was considerably smaller than the other two boys and was the athletic one. Although he had a fascination with dark themes, he did not dress the part of a goth, emo, or doom metalhead. He was a starter on the basketball team, and every year he played Little League Baseball. This was a big year for him because, for the first time, he was eligible for high school sports. I'm in. I'm going to say two weeks, and the rebel will fall, Ray said, making it a three-way bet. I think both of you are way too optimistic. Okay, what does the winner get? Kenan asked. As audacious as it may seem, the boys never bet anything of worth, and the winner was never paid. Their impulsive gambling was more imaginative, and nothing exchanged hands between them. The three together were dauntless. To bet against the three of them, in unity, would be an ambitious enterprise. Jack, Keenan, and Ray were resourceful, yet when they added their female friend Esperia into the mix, they were formidable. But on this day, Hysteria was not among the lot. She'd so chosen to retreat for the day into a shopping coma, as her mother labeled it. This was a joke between Hysteria and the boys, when she and her mother only focused on an afternoon of bargain hunting. Hysteria was 14, almost 15, and she was more or less a big sister to the three. The boys were walking past the cemetery. A new grave had been dug, freshly turned over soil, appearing darker than the usual soil. The fertile richness seemed too enriched with nutrients to use on a corpse. Let's check it out, Jack suggested. The open pit had no barriers, no caution tape, strong, preventing anyone from falling into the six-foot-deep rectangular hollow depression. All of the dug soil was mounted on one side, and the boys stood in a line opposite the mound, peering down into the fissure. Keenan, in a moment of youthful reflection, stated, Makes you wonder, huh? Ray shrugged his shoulders and asked, Wonder? About what? Keenan paused, and the words found their way to his lips. You know, death and what comes next. Very heavy subject, Ray replied. Well, we're standing at an open grave in the middle of a cemetery, Jack reminded him. I suppose you have a point, Ray agreed. If I jump into the hole, what will you give me? Ray wondered precipitously. Give you? Keenan laughed. Why would you want to jump in there? Jack inquired with a hint of skepticism in his voice. You know, because it's there. And I've never been in a grave before, Ray answered. You can see what's down there from standing here. And as far as never being in a grave before... They usually make the reservation after you're dead, Keenan cautioned. Ignoring the common sense of his two companions, Ray revisited the question and posed it again. Come on, what will you give me? I'll give you a hand out of the hole after you realize there's nothing down there. And it's a stupid thing to do, Jackie. Good enough, Ray said, and injudiciously dropped down into the grave. He landed safely and looked up at his friends. It seems deeper than it looks, but also narrower, he informed them. Jack cried back to him. Okay, you've proved your point. Here, reach up. Take my hand. Hold on a second. I, I see something. Ray alerted them. You better not be messing with us, Keenan warned. No, for real, it's in the dirt. Ray was aware of his friends wanted him out of the hole. But he was now digging in the dirt. Got it. Get me out of here, he said, with slight anxiety in his words. Well, Jack and Keenan bent to their knees and leaned over the pit, taking Ray's hand and, with some effort, pulled him out of the soon-to-be permanently occupied resting place. Take a look at this. Ray opened his hand, and in his palm was a round, spiral, fossilized shell 
that was embedded in an ink black stone. Very cool, Jack remarked. Now you have yourself a souvenir, Jenin stated. Ray slipped his prize into his pocket, and the boys made their way out of the cemetery. They were heading toward home and down the lane, a one lane road, where each boy's family lived within proximity to the other. The boys noticed Hesperia's mom's car was in their drive, which meant the shopping spree was finished and she'd be home. This delighted them because Hesperia had a board game the four of them loved to play called Eldritch Horror. The game's plot involves defeating Lovecraftian horrors and stopping the Ancient One from awakening. The goal of the game was to win by solving three great mysteries. Hesperia was glad to see her friends and eagerly invited them in. Although she was a brainy geek of a girl, she was a bit of tomboy as well. The boys had not yet had dinner, so Hesperia, for their mother's permission, invited them to stay. Each boy phoned their parents and informed them they would not be home for dinner, and that they'd be playing a game which would take up most of the evening. After a dinner of grilled cheese sandwiches, pickles, and potato chips, the four friends ended up in the basement sitting around a game table. Ray proudly removed the fossil rock from his pocket and presented it to Hesperia for examination. She admired the unusual rock and carefully gave it a look over. You got this from the bottom of an open grave? Yeah. Do you think it's like a good luck charm? Ray smiled. It's probably a charm, all right, but I doubt if it'll bring you any luck. Hesperia answered warily. She placed the fossil rock in the center of the board game, where they were about to play and started setting up the game. Eldritch Horror was a mythos game that demanded full concentration. The occult phenomenon of the game and investigations that had to be conducted made it seem very real. There was also the fantasy aspect of combat encounters with monsters, trying not to be ambushed. If a player were to run out of health or sanity, they would be defeated. They played the game until, once again, Spiria was awarded the winner. The time was late and everyone had grown tired. Leaving the table, Ray remembered his fossil rock and turned to retrieve it. It was no longer in the center of the board game, which was still fully displayed on the table. Does anyone see my rock? Ray asked. I must have moved it, Jack said, not seeing it either. There it is. Kenan had found it three steps up on the staircase, leading out of the basement. Weird, Hesperia noted. I didn't put it there, Kenan denied. Maybe it was going back to the graveyard. Jack teased. Yeah, maybe. Gray pretended not to be moved by the odd event, but deep in his mind he wondered. Hesperia saw the boys to the door and watched the three of them wander off toward their homes. The street fell silent with the last light glowing in the window extinguished, and everyone was snuggled warmly in their beds. Ray slept upstairs, his head room all to himself, while his younger brothers, two of them, shared a room across the hall together. Ray was awakened abruptly by a sound unfamiliar to him. This was the early morning hours when nothing should be stirring. The mice would be pressed together for warmth. They would not be making a peep. Ray's eyes opened. The jolt had him fully awake, but rather than getting out of bed, he lay disoriented and strained to listen. Something was stirring outside, possibly the wind, yet the sound did not repeat. While intensely focusing on anything out of the ordinary, he caught a foul whiff of what reminded him of a wet dog. The stench carried with it a mossy odor, an unpleasant fetidness thick in the air as it was to the taste in its mouth. There was a sound at the glass of his bedroom window. His eyes lit up, large. His curiosity caused him to want to investigate the noise. He did like a good, ominous mystery, but surprises were not his favorite thing to encounter, especially late at night in his home. The sheet wrapped around his body for warmth gingerly approached the window. He avidly listened to the faint scratching and climb sounds. The blinds had been pulled down, but the glow of the moon filtered strands of light threads through the cracks. Ray took the blinds cord mechanism and gave it a pull. He gasped and flinched, 
taking an involuntary step backward. The glass in the window was covered with small brown moths. There seemed to be hundreds of them, active and alive, out in the cold of the night, climbing on one another, clinging to the window pane. Some fluttered, others had their wings wrapped around their bodies like tents, crawling insensibly. The moon's glow, full glow, highlighted the eclipse, leaving Ray unhappily surprised and even more perplexed. He doubted his own senses. The animalist stayed through him for a loop. He wasn't sure if he could truly believe his eyes. He turned to find a light switch, but stiffened when his eyes caught the sight of something lying in his bed. He stared at the figure, which appeared to be man-sized, but was covered with the top blanket. It was everything he could do not to scream. Maybe that was what he needed to do, sound the alarm, warn his family, let out that blood-curdling scream. But he did none of those things. With ambitious curiosity, he inched his way toward his bed. And, as irrational as it sounds, he wanted to be sure if he had to run outside, he'd be warm. But he did everything in his power not to make a sound. As he placed his hand on his coat, he felt his fossil rock in the pocket. The figure in his bed somewhat stirred. Ray backed away from the bed, slipping his arms through the sleeves, and moved cat-like to his bedroom door. Just as he reached the door figure in the bed rose like a mummy from the tomb and bellowed loud enough to wake the dead. Put it back! The voice was insolent, demonic, with an echoing eeriness. Ray fingered and groped for the light switch, and when the brilliant overhead light shone, wiping out the dark of the room, there was no one in his bed. His eyes immediately diverted to the window where the moths had gathered not a single moth clinging to the cold pane of glass. Yet there was something even more disturbing. There appeared a filmy, indistinct impression of a man's face with a sinister rictus grin on the outside of the glass. It was a horrible face. Ray was not sleeping in another wing of the room. Nothing could justify him returning upstairs, at least until it was daylight gone downstairs and lit the house up like Fort Knox and turned on the TV for security reasons. He decided not to wake anyone in the house. He'd had no real proof of what had occurred other than the facial impressions on his window. Ray was like a trapped little rabbit, hunted now cornered in the bush. His heart quickened and he expected another visitation. He watched TV the rest of the morning, mindful of every little noise from the trappings of modernity. Intrinsically, he was not a nervous boy, but the appearance of strange manifestations had pushed him to the edge. Without another unexplained event, at 8 a.m. he phoned Jack, explaining to him what it had been exposed to overnight. He swore to Jack, promising it literally occurred. He was not embellishing the events at all. Told you the rock should have stayed in the grave, was all Jack said. You gotta put it back, Ray said, galvanized by the event. You have to put it back, exclaimed Jack with the emphasis on the word you. Whatever. You all were there with me. You gotta help me, Ray pleaded. Help you do what? Just go back and throw it in the hole, Jack advised, sounding somewhat disparaging about the whole matter. Ray phoned Keenan, but Keenan felt as Jack did. He did not want any part of a demonic rock. Desperate, knowing that returning the stone was his only vindication, Ray phoned Asperia and was obdurate, not willing to change one word of his story. She agreed to go with him as far as the edge of the cemetery. She had a tendency, as Ray did, for the darker things, but not when the dark things became life-threatening. Ray and Hesperia walked together toward the cemetery, Ray was uneasy, feeling far less indomitable uh, the closer they became. Ray made the sign of the cross, falling back on his religious upbringing. When they reached the edge of the cemetery, they were disheartened to discover the funeral for the man whose grave Ray had stolen the fossil rock from was underway. There were over a dozen mourners dressed in black, and the service had commenced. Oh, 
Oh, this is not good. Not good at all. Sperry is dressed. <laughs> You're telling me? Now what do we do? I took a lifeguard course last year, right? You want to know what I learned? Sperry's question seemed completely off topic. Reluctantly, Ray asked. No, I don't know. Hesperia twisted her head toward Ray and answered, I learned if a person is drowning and you jump in to save them, you'd likely be drowned by the very person you're trying to save due to their panic and the erratic fight for life behavior. I'm just asking, are you panicking? Because I do not want to drown. Ray realized by his own omission he was dragging his friend into the deeper waters with him. No, 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 no. I, I get it. I can do this. I'll wait until everyone's gone. Then I'll casually walk over and toss the rock back into the grave. That's easy enough, Ray promised. You won't need my help for that, Hesperia said. No, you can't leave. Not yet. Stay with me. I'm still spooked about that thing. You can't begin to imagine what I went through last night. Ray begged. You know, it's just your guilt manifesting itself and playing tricks on your mind for robbing the dead, don't you? Hesperia was usually always straightforward and didn't mince her words. I can't say what happened. All I know is I never want to go through anything like it again. Ray contended. The gloom of the funeral had a vile contagion that dampened Ray's spirit to the lowest foreboding degree. Colonel Paul enveloped him as he watched the solemn obsequious end and counted the mourners as they walked away one by one. Ray saw no way to circumvent his approach. He had to walk straight ahead, not deviate, not be afraid. It was a simple task. Even a two-year-old could do it. Walk to the grave, toss the rock in before the gravediggers returned to cover the coffin with dirt. It seemed the curiosity was too much for Jack and Keenan, who were now making their way to the cemetery to join Hesperia. They noticed Ray was about halfway across the gravesite when Hesperia noticed the two boys. Making him do it alone, huh? Jack grunted. If one ounce of what he said about last night's true, it may very well be a demonic minefield that he's maneuvering. Kenan said dramatically, I wasn't interested in becoming a casualty of war, so I remained here. Hesperia smiled. Fair enough, Jack said keeping his eyes on Ray, who had yet to look back. Just here for moral support, he finished. Paying close attention to what was unfolding, they were holding their breath. When Ray had gotten near the open grave, he suddenly stopped. They noticed the debility of his hands, hanging limply by his sides. He was frozen as a stone. With growing concern, Jack asked, Why isn't he moving? He's scared, Keenan suggested. No, I think it's something else. I think he might be in trouble, Hesperia said. What should we do, asked Keenan. Jack yelled out, Ray, are you all right? There was no answer. Ray stood in mindless limbo with the deepest sense of disconnect. He might as well have been a corpse himself. He quivered with a wave of horripilation. His friends only saw Ray standing amidst the gravestones. He saw what none of his friends could see. Ray's world was distorted with a stormy gray sky. Atop the grave, hovering like a fiendish wraith, was the ghost of the man in the box. He had only made his appearance known to the one whom he claimed had robbed his grave. Ray withered as the translucent apparition crept closer to him. Only Ray could hear the belittling, the railings, and cursed accusations against him. You desecrated my grave. I'm cursed to wander the earth without rest. I've been defiled and denied in my part of the first resurrection. You had no right. Ray wanted to resist, yet hopelessness does not make men brave. He longed for the youthful rebellion to laugh in the face of death yet confronted with such appalling insecurities mingled with the awful chill up his spine. His brain knew nothing, had no struggle in his being. He had gone numb. His body was in impalpable shock, emotionally bankrupt. He was 
no more than a stone himself, dead weight, a statue as unassuming as a yard gnome. What Ray was unaware of was the bravery of his friends, who decided to carry out a rescue mission and were coming full force to aid him. They did not understand what diabolical forces were manipulating their young friend. Ray had never considered his own mortality, he was far too young, to consider such an adult thing. He did not know what death smelled like, if it had an odor at all, yet he could smell a sickening sweet resinous odor. It was a smell he was not familiar with. It had a rancidity that burned his nose and caused his eyes to water. He fought riotous emotions with his mind. His body would not respond. The wraith made a circle around Ray and hissed with intense hostility. You have something of mine. It belongs to me. Now you belong to me. The circle that the wraith had made seemed to be a type of invisible lariat. It wrapped around Ray's rigid body and bound him like an Egyptian mummy. He absorbed several hard blows to the stomach by an unseen fist, and all the air gushed from his lungs. Construction became more severe. Ray was without breath. He felt elongated, dagger-like fingernails probing his face. The slicing of his flesh came next. The knives were penetrating, cutting, and his back opened. It was exposed as the evil spirit raked its hooked talons down Ray's spinal cord. Ray's color left his body as the darkness seeped in through the opening. Like cold syrup, the black was evolving. Ray was in a levitated upright posture and drifted toward the yawning grave. Ray was caught in a swirling, choking flood of apprehension. The rotten and the diseased awaited him in the decaying burial world. Nothing could be preserved forever. Nothing retained its form or composition. All succumbed to the dirt, returning to where these mortal frames were borrowed from. Death was life ceased. Sunshine was replaced by darkness. Composition. Skin turned brown, then black. The beetle, the worm, bacteria, fungi, mites, ants, all things nocturnal came to feed on the sticky, the dry, the gory slime. Death was a loathsome door whose depths are unfathomable. It had no color was obscene and cold. The disintegration had dripped like a leaky tap. The substance of a body feeding ravenous open mouths beneath. The dead are forever hungry. Their appetites never quenched. So they dine on the dead. The dead feed the dead. And none can eat the dead flesh without choking. Every bite is choked down, never satisfied. As the darkness flooded Ray's mind, absorbing the light, he sensed he was being touched by the physical world. Understanding little but aware, in the event the darkness swallowed him whole, he could not escape and would be digested slowly throughout eternity. The thought of this was too unpleasant. It was something he needed to eradicate from his thoughts. He seemed to be in a tug of war being pulled and jerked from every side. The wraith resisted with demonic fury disembodied person refusing to give up. Ray heard his friends calling his name. This was encouraging, and he felt helpless in his own rescue. His greatest fears were imagined. He saw through the veil into the abyss, and what he saw was indescribably ghastly. Leprous, diseased bodies, white like clay, amassed with weeping living sores. Ray believed he was being dragged back into the land of the living, but the dead followed closely behind, biting at him, desperately trying to latch onto him with terrible, deformed hands. Nameless creatures from beyond the realm of all animated cried out their displeasure. There was a hand digging into Ray's coat pocket. He didn't know if it was friend or foe, but he was in no position to even take a violent dislike to his manhandling. The blinding force of a higher power than Ray had ever known was something he had not recognized thus far. This gave him some resolve, for it was not malevolent or malicious. It was soothing, calm, full of light. 
all moroseness was dispelled. Ray heard the disembodied cry out, like a crowd clamoring at a villain being burned at the stake, as he inexorably slipped out of their clutches. The ground was hard and cold. Ray heard the ingratiating voices of his friends, who dragged him away from the gravesite to the edge of the cemetery. Are you with us? Jack asked breathing like one who'd run a world-record sprint. Ray could not answer immediately. He simply nodded. Are you hurt? Hesperia kindly asked. Ray was unsure if he was injured or not. He tried to move. The best way to experience pain is to get up, he thought to himself. He was studied by his friends as he sat up of his own accord. Is it over? If there's a God in heaven, it's over. Hesperia answered. Ray indicated that he was well enough to stand. He seemed to have suffered more mental damage than any physical carnage. Is the rock back at the grave? Ray asked, feeling his empty pockets. Yes, I managed to find it in your pocket and tossed it into the grave. It seems like returning the rock stopped all the spooky paranormal stuff. I don't know what you saw, but we saw you floating and being tossed around by something invisible. This very answered. I'm glad you didn't see what I saw. It was black. Oh, so black. Ray began to weep. His emotions had now come to light and had gotten the better of him. His mind changed from numbed and lugubrious into thoughtful reflection. This impacted the group as well, and for a little while no one said anything. They crouched on their knees in a tight circle, heads pressed against one another's arms around the shoulders, and comforted one another with hugs and pats. The poltergeist found its rest. A mound of loose dirt covered the undisturbed grave later in the day. Over time, grass grew in the spot with no obvious depression in the earth. Innocuously, no evidence of the battle for the fossil rock and the soul which possessed it could be gathered. To be fair, this was not a lesson that had to be repeated or incolated to understand the moral of the story. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Summed it up nicely. The friends spent a few days apart processing the harrowing adventure they'd shared, trying to arrive at some solace and self-conciliation. The following Friday, they met in Hesperia's basement to resume their Eldridge horror game. Nothing else was ever mentioned of that nearly fateful day in the old cemetery. The boys hadn't noticed the single leaf that they'd made bets on was still hanging on with all it's worth. I hope you enjoyed Live and Learn by Dale Thompson as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. You can mainly find him hanging around his YouTube channel, the official Dale Thompson show, filled with music and other offbeat wonders, or check out his prolific and growing collection of stories. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please give him a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show in the Otis Edge. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. While some might think that that rock was best left alone, I guess it depends on what your definition of fun might be. I know of at least two people who'd love to play around with that rock and see what happens next. Or at least... Two people I would love to see play with that rock. But maybe you're lucky. Death seems a long ways off. You're in good health, good spirits, reclining, and looking forward to the new year with hope and excitement in your heart. And thankfully, you're not like the man in our next story. Whatever he's got, it's catching, and it's not something anyone one thing about laying down and rotting away in one's own virtual prison, there's always the chance for a visitor. This one has something he desperately wants. 
Without further ado, I present to you The Promise of the Imp. I have fallen ill. My horror is the aches will never abandon me, and through the sensitivity of loathsome dread, I'll be plundered until the richness of my virtue has been drained. My teeth hurt as if I were drinking a toxic plasma of regions of sulfur outside of this world. I've taken the train during an outbreak of some dread virus which is only not just killed indiscriminately, but has eaten away at the fabric of our conscience as well as our decency. This foul disease is no better than a blood-sucking leech sent to drain the life from old and young alike. Here I am, at its absent mercy. My work has suffered greatly due to my sudden illness. No one is allowed direct contact with me because I could be contagious. I would give anything for a simple human embrace. A hacking cough has cracked ribs and made my back sensitive to an unfamiliar chill which I've found no warmth to suffice. I've been reduced to a single room, my meals prepared by my sister, and with a knock, I know the plate or bowl is there. After I hear her feet shuffle off, I sufferably make my way across the floor and retrieve my meal. I feel lower than a yard dark. I'm still looking for my lungs because I know as hard as I've coughed in the recent hours, they must have come flying out. I've tried to sleep, for I'm weary. Yet no sooner as I get comfortable, I cough. I can feel the cough coming before it arrives, and to alleviate some pain, I wrap my frail arms around my body and squeeze, compress my torso, and it makes it easier to yield to the hacking nuisance. I know others are concerned. I've received several visitors who all speak to me from the other side of the door, and always give me the same five parting words. I'm praying for I need a remedy, not more prayers. It's not like I don't have faith or I don't believe in the power of prayer, but at the moment, faith has not been in the equation for the past few days. Give me pills, transfusions, injections, even a sponge bath. But prayers linger in the heavens too long and I cannot afford the delay. This is an evil malady, twitching like a curse. Only a haggard witch could summon such a maledict. One wishing calamity could impose such throat-stripping, needle-pricking excruciations. I'm not ready to die, so I will see what my sister has brought me. I need nourishment. It's chicken soup. I drink the broth slowly and feel a singular moment of respite. I'm only able to drink half the broth has suddenly turned on me like a lance driven into my gut. Though I found some comfort for my throat, the thought of more broth sickens me even more. This bane laid upon me is a thief which denies me of every consolation. Sympathy has been removed from this room, and my joy for life wanes terribly. Whatever this imprecation, I find it insulting as it dehumanizes a man. Resurrection is my only solace. It's possible I can depart this world for paradise, where such afflictions don't exist. Nothing impure can enter those gates. I anticipate my first step through the veil where my flesh is changed, and my mind is awakened to irresistible truth, which I will embrace and never release. I've placed my feeble head upon my pillow. My sheets are becoming stale. I have no replacements, and my pillowcase is encrusted with residue from me falling apart. My fevered, weakened body lies exhausted, and my mind thinks the worst. I will be an easy hoist downward, for I'm gaunt as a skeleton, and as emaciated as one suffering anorexia. I admire my purple veins, for I've never seen them bulge like this before. If I'd seen those giant wormy veins like this before I fell ill, I would have thought they were the most grotesque display I'd ever witnessed. 
Yet now, I see their beauty. I swear I feel the shadows of the room lying in the hollows of my cheeks. They feel heavy. Sometimes, like cold and compressed. My eyes won't stop draining. I know my eyes are swollen, red, tearful. Yet it is from the severe malaise, just another symptom of this ethereal hoax cast upon me. Now, I wish my sister had remembered the newspaper. At least I could see if I'd made the obituaries yet. She's a darling of a girl, younger than I and full of joy in life. She has a bright future ahead if she stays out of public places where diseases fornicate and leave their grimy residue upon handrails, doorknobs, countertops. And whatever she does, she must never take the train again. The train is a sealed test tube of human decay. They all should be decommissioned. If I survive this, I will be far more cautious while out in public if I afford myself such a luxury to enter the world of nasty humans with their liquid forms oozing something from their salty pores constantly. I slept a short while, but something gave me a rude awakening. At least I awoke. I heard something walking. It sounded like bare feet on my wooden bedroom floor. Have I come to the point of true delirium, paranoia, and hallucinations? I pray not. But the unmistakable footfalls were audible or at least I convinced myself they were real noises. Maybe I was merely longing for companionship and wished an apparition to my bedside for needed comfort. I can't say one way or the other. The current of cold air convinced me I was withering away to nothing. In these moments of disquiet, this is where I get the full brunt of the fatigue my body's enduring. The room becomes eerily silent and all I hear is my body fading away. Maybe I'll ask my sister to bring me some homemade baked bread, dripping with butter. Her bread's the work of perfection, and for the physical disruption of my life, left me a helpless statistic on a doctor's chart. I could consume an entire loaf in one sitting, especially if she added her olive oil and garlic dip. But now I must brush these thoughts away because the idea of it is sickening to me. If anyone had tried to convince me a year ago, I would reject buttered bread hot from the oven. I would have thought such a suggestion to be deplorable. Yet in my decrepit condition, it is repulsive to my palate. I'm unable to think of anything worse than where I am now. I'm a prisoner in my own home. I'm deathly sick no treatment except chicken broth. I have no human content. I was told uh, early on by the original doctor to open my window to allow fresh air in. Recently, when the doctor did come to visit and record my condition, he advised me to keep the windows sealed for fear I might provoke pneumonia. In such case, it would lead to a grave situation. I must fight the ever-haunting delirium. If I permit myself to entertain the tremens, it'll be the end of me. But I have no choice but to keep a right mind. I slept once more. According to my side dresser clock, I slept four hours, which is more than I've rested in many days. Although I remain alone in my quarantine, I cannot help but be suspicious, for I had a creeping sensation. I must ask myself the question, has someone watched me while I slept? Call me paranoid, but I would swear there was a felt presence near, which has compounded my already turbulent confusion with a press of anxiety. Depression has befriended me, and I believe, as a bosom companion, it will walk beside me until journey's end. My intuition is seldom wrong, I've dismissed depression as a cause for my provocation. The attributing factors are not of this tangible sort. There remains a propensity, though primitive, that I could be in suffering, and 
deny existence to escape some hidden necessity that negates all probability of getting well again. Fully awake, the senses are tender like a reed, my heart affable to receive, and there it is again, footfalls on my bedroom floor. An unnatural, pervading darkness permeated every corner of the room, struggling as I must, slide my legs out over the side of the bed and push myself up into a sitting position. I could hardly believe my own eyes. There was a tiny little man, somewhat tawdry, and rigid, staring up at me from the floor. I say a man, yet a better description would be some type of ancient humanoid, developed fully, yet not as you or I in the traditional sense of normal. It looked to have a sinister red face, a face born of suffering, unreadable, mystical, insidious, and duplicitous, no doubt, with tight, thin lips that did not appear to be directly threatening me. I saw no reason to be rude, so I politely asked, uh, can I help you with something? Without changing expressions, it replied, now you can see me? Excellent. Getting seen in your world has never been so hard. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm known as Hawkman Ru Anweir. No need to introduce yourself. I know you're already Hyatt Raleigh Maxfield. I'm an educated man, and most of the time logical, and I can be quite understanding and, by and large, observant. Yet I was baffled by what was being presented before me. It defied logic and understanding. I found it at the time to be undefinable, yet one word did come to mind. Strange. The little man, Falkman, then commenced making himself comfortable by leaning effortlessly up against the armrest of my bedside reading chair. I instantly began to feel nauseous and leaned over from the waist to get a sick gut. Falkman offered to help. Let me ease your suffering, Hyatt. The little man was no man at all. He was a devilish imp. He rubbed his hands together and then cupped them with palms up as if he were holding liquid like a bowl. He went on to blow into his hands and the yellow pixelated sparkle magically appeared. Then, with one big puff from his tiny lungs, this now golden ball of light was carried from his hands and straight into my face. Within seconds, I was well. My sickness had departed, and for the most part, I was partially convinced that, through some miracle, I was made whole. A warm tune, for his voice was pleasant and assuring. How is it even possible? I asked with an exuberance in my voice I had not heard in ages. Magic, Hyatt. Just old magic. Would you like to feel this way all the time? He asked. It had been so long since I had good health. I was ecstatic. I could not be sure if I remembered a time when I ever felt so lively. Yes, I would like to feel this way every day. I played it, fearing there would be a cause for this wellness. I know secrets vaster than the stars and the heavens, but tonight it does not matter. I am easy to work with, Hyatt. Some of us. You know, imps. This was the first time he referred to himself as what he was. We can be hard to deal with. I do not require much. If you give to me, I give back to you tenfold. I'm here for you, to draw out your intrepid side. If it is within my power to give it, I will give you whatever you ask, as long as I'm afforded with health. I agreed, grateful even for the smallest mercies. Falkman asked, Do you believe in God? I wondered if this was a test. Would my answers determine my fate? I answered honestly, I do. He asked a second question. Do you believe the devil exists? Again, I answered truthfully. Maybe not the red horn variety with a pointy tail and a pitchfork, but yes, the entity of the devil exists. In my frame of mind, there was no right answer, and there was no wrong answer. Simple enough. Me, 
and lots of it. I have a ferocious appetite, some would even dare to say voracious. I prefer it raw, but beggars cannot be choosers. And one last thing, you can tell no one of this. Do we have a deal? asked Fuckman. Any preposterous questions would go unanswered, but I need not fear because he asked no more questions. He quickly avaunted, and I did not see him until the next day. I did prepare for his return. I could not be sure if my answers sufficed, but this little man was coming back to make me whole. I wanted to prove to him I was solid and mad of my word. I called out to my sister and insisted I needed meat. My sister questioned me about my intent with the meat because it was a peculiar request from a man who could barely sip soup. I explained in no uncertain terms I needed my strength, and the protein would accelerate my healing process. I instructed her not to go to a lot of trouble in preparation. The rawer, the better. Falkman returned the following days, and his eyes lit up like a small child who first sees the presents under the Christmas tree. I had a couple of bloody steaks waiting for him, along with a small pork roast. Without a word, the finished little glutton stuffed his face full of the meat, swelling his belly like a balloon. He sat back and belched rudely and then spoke. You must overlook my manners. You do not have to forgive them because it is what I am. I'm indebted to you. I'm indebted to my creator, who was pleased with me, creating a desire of elementing hunger in me which motivates my emativeness, drives my faculties to inconceivable thoughts. I'm glad you're pleased. Now, for our arrangement and for my health, what must I do to remain well? I had to ask because I felt too good to fall back into the pit of despair which I'd been delivered from not do anything other than our original agreement. You provide me with meat, and when I come, I will christen you with health and well-being, Bakhtin reiterated. How often will you visit me, I asked. I cannot know the frequency of my visits, yet I will leave you with this gift, and it will remain until I return. There is one stipulation, other than keeping this a secret from anyone, and that is still not be permitted outside of this room. My magic is stationary and does not distance well. Very unfortunate to hear. Yet I was willing to remain a prisoner if I never felt sick again. Fockton left me alone again and I entered a substantive mood where I meditated and considered my life. I'd been in convalescent state for so long my mind had lost its ability to think concentrate even to reason. Now, with the gift of good health, I could meditate, read, contemplate clearly. The horror of my condition had been set aside, and I relished in the newfound vitality. Bakhtin said nothing about opening the window, and for the first time in many days, I opened the window wide and stood, arms out by my side, head tilted back, absorbing the light winter's breeze which had stirred. The brisk richness of the cold was a warm welcome, a contradiction to the stifling, stuffy room, shrinking daily, holding me prisoner. Two days passed before Fakhtin returned. He entered the usual way. Suddenly, he was simply there. I paused and greeted him. If you do not mind me asking, where do you go when you leave me? No mind at all, he partially answered as he consumed the last of the pork chops I had my sister delivered to my room. I go to a devilish place. I go where the dead are buried. Hades is the domain I'm a citizen of. So you live among hellfire? My mind can only picture anguish in the place of lichen-stained stones, rotting bodies, toppled tombstones, draped with gray gossamer netting, chipped, cracked, and broken. Black gulfs of open graves where the tormented dead cry out day and night. There's no natural light in our outer darkness. Light comes from the fires we create. Empty sarcophaguses are piled with the bones of the dead, and we ignite them for light and heat. 
The inscriptions of those who had lain in those concrete death chambers are removed, and we are not allowed to remember the names. It's no grief on our part, those like me, as well as myself. We've only known these ways, and we routinely carry out our work just as I am now, Buckman revealed. May I inquire of you one more curiosity that has me troubled, I ask. Indeed, ask me now, for I must be departing soon. Am I going to die? Bogdan, obviously, had not expected such a poignant question. He shrank back. A look swept his face, and just for a moment, I thought I saw an emotion of sorrow. Then his face returned to the stern expression of said which was his characteristic look. I, everyone dies. I nodded in agreement and responded, I guess my real question is, will there ever be a time I can leave this room? Nothing is holding you in here except you. You can leave at any time, but your days will be short. I remind you, my magic is limited in space and time. I cannot simply give you immortality, I am giving you now is relief. You can live this way for many years to come. I always return once an agreement has been made. To leave this room, our agreement is null and void. A vow or agreement broken is irretrievable. It's like having a pitcher of water and pouring it out onto a steamy hot sidewalk. Once it's poured out, the water can never go back into the container. Bogdan left me to my thoughts, and my books, and to my prison. Irresolutely, I saw my room not as a prison, but as my tomb. How'd the pharaohs feel when they inspected their death chambers? Now I was getting a regrettable sensation. I would never leave this room. I attempted to recall the last time I was free. The memory eluded me. I did remember a time of this, but now it seems so long ago. There was a cold tide of insanity rising up in me. I could picture myself standing on a beach watching the sunset with its marvelous reds, oranges, and yellow hues. The sun going down represents when the day is done, when we've ceased from our labors and we may enter our rest. I was unable to imagine the sunrise. How is that possible, I wondered. I deduced it was because it had never been new reborn or start again. Everything I was, all the resilience in me was working toward finality. Misgivings were beginning to assail me as if I existed in a desecrated and looted grave. My eyes could see, but had I become blind? I could hear, but had I gone deaf? I could speak, but are these the words from a pure heart? I'm unable to touch life nor inhale its nectar. Only stench lingered in the air. I remain in a putrid state. My sister surprised me with a large ham in today's newspaper. I had my share and read through the paper. It's ironic. Today's paper came with the same headlines and the same stories as to what was in print two weeks before and two weeks prior to that. The carnal darkness pressed realizing that mankind is on repeat, just like me, trapped, caged, doing the exact same thing day in and day out. I am nobody. I'm soon to be another statistic. My humanity wasted, my story forgotten. It's transparent before my eyes. Humanity revolves like the hands of a clock in this circular motion, until an appointed time, and we die. Do not believe for one minute Bachman is extended by life by days. I see now he's merely given me quality of life within the parameters of his power. I'm appreciative, genuinely grateful. I truly am. The only way I can remove the sting of death is to take matters into my own hands. There are a couple of things I wish to do before my time ends. I will decide when my candle is distinguished. I will create my fate. I am no longer afraid. My hygiene has become malodorous. I had to do something about it to make myself presentable. 
My beard was unmanaged, my hair disheveled. I instructed my sister to bring me scissors and a sharp razor, along with soap and a pan of boiling water with a hand mirror. She did as I asked her. I will admit it took some grooming, but in the end I believed I looked and certainly smelled like a new man. When Falkland appeared again, he was shocked at my transformation. I see you're taking better care of yourself now. Thanks to me, you are well, he boasted. I thought it was time I stopped looking beleaguered tidying myself. It's a terrible shame, a real contemptuous pity. You have no one you can present yourself to. It sounded to me that Fockton was leery of my reasons for cleaning myself up. Oh, you know, since I've gotten well, thanks to you. I acknowledged making up an excuse. I need to get scrubbed and get rid of the stench. I like you better with the beard, Fockton remarked. I could see him sniffing the air, walking about, and I knew what was on his mind. Now my beard won't grow back. That's the good thing about a bad haircut. It'll always grow back, I reminded him. And, as I believe now, I needed to be guarded. Aren't we missing something here? Fockton asked, perplexed. Missing something? I pretended not to know what he was referencing. Our agreement. My meat. He chuckled as if he'd hoped it was a mere oversight. Easily remedied. Oh, the meat. Is what you're not obviously alluding to. Uh, sorry, no meat today. I politely informed him. Which he instantly interpreted as something insincere. My meat. I want my meat. His voice raised. His face swelled with anger. There is no more meat responded, acting nonchalant about the matter. What is this? You know, without meat, my meat, for me, my meat, you'll become sick again. It was a stark reminder, but I'd already considered the consequences. It is unfortunate, with all apologies. I must break our contract. I cannot go on as your prisoner, I candidly announced. Wouldn't you agree? Say so if you do. Life is worth living. The veins in the tiny person's neck grotesquely bulged under the strain. But this isn't life, I snapped at him, knowing this had all to be a scam. Nothing actually for me in the long run. It was a ruse for Batman so he could enjoy the orgy of flesh. You confess to me in full confidence you believe in God and the devil. Don't you see they are two opposing forces? Bidding for your soul? Are you simply going to ignore your faith or convictions? Abandon your conscience and surrender now. His psychological games would not work on me. I do not see myself as waving a white flag. Surrender means submitting to the enemy. I'm not conceding defeat. I'm merely relinquishing my role in this cosmic game of table tennis. For me to forfeit is not losing. It means going out on my terms, under my own volition, my own strength, with a clear conscience and clarity of mind. My attempts to reason with him were falling on deaf ears. It was a tinderbox. The fuse was lit. The static childish rage and concentrated stabbing fury exploded like a powder keg. His indignation was unmatched by any man or beast I'd ever witnessed before. His abominable anger, implacable and unrelenting, was from someone who was caught in the throes of sheer madness. I would not permit my fear to betray me, although he was inexplicably drawing nearer to me. With his rant, I never looked back. You shall not leave me. Give me meat. He could demand all he wanted, but my determination was fixed. Today is my day, Falcon. Stand out of my way. Don't last a day without me. Cure for the human condition is disease. His threats no longer meant anything to me. It's okay. I'm okay with that. One day only is all I need. My future is dire, and I see it's upon me. I embrace what's next. It was a great sensation. I flung open my bedroom door. 
Timely, my dear sister just so happened to be standing there. I embraced her with a brotherly passion and kissed her cheek. One last look into her precious, loving eyes, and I was satisfied. At least she did not have to see me in my former death throes. I was going to live whatever portion of life remained, regardless of how little was left. Bachman's shrill warnings and threats quickly faded. I had double-crossed the devil. Maybe I had hell to pay later. But not on this day. This day was all mine. I hope you enjoyed The Promise of the Imp by Dale Thompson, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Come for the monstrous entities waiting to haunt you from beyond the grave. Stay for the rocking tunes on the Dale Thompson channel on YouTube. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. As a reminder, if you decide to give tonight's talented author's stories a read, please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote be sure to let them know you heard about them here on this program and that Otis sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure that would be much appreciated by Dale as well. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark, especially as we enter our 12th season of frights, fun, and sleepless evenings. We have more planned for you in the next season, So stay tuned as we weave in and out stories of ghouls, ghosts, monstrosities, tortured psyches, and even the occasional madman. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012 all of it ad free if you happen to use facebook twitter instagram or youtube you can follow and subscribe to chilling tales for dark nights there where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week you can subscribe to me on the youtube as well at the otis jerry channel where you'll find releases of my series or a story time dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>